let me talk for a moment uh, a little bit about what we know in the Holocaust, what we're learning, and a little bit also about how we're learning it. Um, let's start with basics. I don't know what your background is, so let me start with, base, with basics. One of the things that one had presumed for a very long time, there was debate in the historical schools of the Holocaust between what is called the intentionalists and the functionalists. The intentionalists were those who believed that the Holocaust as a crime began full throttle, meaning that they understood what they were about to do and why they were about to do it. And the only question was, how do you implement it and what do you do to get it done? And in fact, one can see an evolution of the policy regarding the destruction of the Jews. Essentially, if I were to teach you a basic introduction of the Holocaust while I stood on one leg, I would say you have to know essentially six concepts. Definition, expropriation, concentration, mobile killing units, death camps, and then on the side, deportation. By that I mean that essentially it, the Nazis came with an anti-Semitic racist policy. The racist policy essentially established the Germans as the master race and all other races as subservient. The greater the proximity to Germany in the West, the closer you were to the master race, the more you went east, especially in the Slavic countries, the lower your run. And the one group that they define as essentially a cancer on the German body politic were the Jews. And you have to imagine that this is a little bit of Darwin's survival of the fittest and pure absolute racism. And we'll see how it evolves in a moment. The question then becomes, if you're going to discriminate against the Jews, and you're going to legally discriminate against Jews, you need a concept of who is Jew. And that concept was introduced two years after the beginning of the persecution of Jews. And the concept essentially was embodied in law in something called the Nuremberg Laws of 1935. Nuremberg Laws of 1935 essentially defined the Jews biologically based on the religion of their grandparents and took away the rights of citizenship from the Jews and in one sense made them subjects or wards of the state. It prohibited uh, marriage or sexual relations between Jews and Aryans. And it also meant that no woman under the age of 45 could work in a Jewish household as a domestic, not because there is no sexual relations over 45. Now being over 45, I can hopefully say that that is not the case. <laughs> but um, there is, at that point, there was no pregnancy over the age of 45, and consequently, it was safer, as it were. Jews were not allowed to pl fly the German flag, the swastika, and they were, in one sense, if you teach it as part of Jewish history, they were disemancipated, meaning they lost civil rights. In America, it would be the reversal of all that was achieved in the last half century regarding civil rights. It would be segregation, isolation, persecution, and all of that. But the most intriguing thing is the way in which Jews were defined. Not on their religion, not on their parents' religion, but on the biological inheritance of their grandparents. That ironically created a problem for the churches. Anybody want to guess what the problem for the churches was? What makes you a Christian? This is not a trick question, folks. Because you profess it? What? But what's the ritual that makes you a Christian? What? Baptism. Now, if you're a baptized person, baptized in the church, in any one of the churches, you are what? Christian. But remember that the German state defined Jews biologically based on the religion of their grandparents, 
She went up with an anomaly that Protestant ministers, Roman Catholic priests, and Roman Catholic nuns were all defined as Jews by the state. And consequently, if you look at the communication of protests issued by the churches, very often it is for those whom they regard as Christians whom the Nazis regarded as Jews, because the definition is biological. And what's the other thing about being defined biologically <coughs> based on the religion of grandparents? We have no choice as to who our parents are, and even less choice as to who our grandparents are. And consequently, it's not something we choose. It is something imposed upon us, as it were, by our biological inheritance. From 1933 through 1939, the Germans practiced a policy regarding the Jews, and we'll see regarding other people in a different way. They practiced a policy which was called uh, expropriation, but it could also be called disemancipation. It could also be called segregation, isolation. It could also be called persecution. Loss of civil liberties, loss of civil rights, discrimination in businesses, expulsion from schools, universities, etc. And the policy was essentially designed for one purpose, and that is if you want to know the secret of immigration, you have to know two basic words. All of immigration can be explained by something called push pull. You are pushed from where you are, you are pulled drawn to somewhere else. Sometimes the drawing is because of economic opportunities. Very often the drawing is freedom. Even more often the drawing for movement, for leaving one place, going to another, is love. And that is that many of you would not contemplate leaving here, leaving California, whatever have you. You fell in love with somebody who lived in New York and you were commuting by coastally, you enjoyed each other, etc., etc. Eventually, what would happen? One of the two of you, if you decided to get married, would move to the other person's location. One of the other reasons you might move is if you got a terrific offer for a job in New Mexico, you might say, okay, economic opportunity. The Germans felt that if they made it impossible for the Jews to live in Germany, they would leave. And the loss of civil rights, civil liberties, discrimination, isolation, segregation are all tools designed to make your life impossible. There were two basic flaws in that strategy. Flaws in that strategy were A, no country was willing to receive the Jews in numbers in which they had to immigrate. And B, the Reich kept expanding. So, for example, between 1933 and March 1938, 150,000 Jews left Germany voluntarily. March 1938, Germany invaded Austria, and in one night it received 200,000 more Jews, or net gain of 50,000 Jews, which meant if you want to get rid of the Jews, you can't do it if you keep expanding and getting more Jews. And the second example is in September 1939, they invaded Poland. <coughs> and when they invaded Poland, another two million Jews came under German domination. Can't get rid of them if you keep expanding. And by 1942, they imagined that they would have 11 million Jews under their control. Therefore, it would not work. Third stage of, it, of the Holocaust was something called concentration, but forget about concentration camps. And see the idea for a moment of using Jews and forcing them to live in a confined area, which in Poland were called ghettos, or isolating them and stigmatizing them by making them wear Jewish stars. Now, one of the reasons they have Jews wear stars is because you don't know necessarily who is Jewish by virtue of appearance. And consequently, when you label them, when you star them, when you use that as a stigmatization, it's a form of isolation. And they kept Jews in a confined area in Poland, the example was ghettoization, but still, no Jews were yet killed. Not systematically, not in a 
ongoing program. A series of Jews were persecuted, some died, but not wholesale slaughter. That ended up changing in June 1941. And the story of the Holocaust can be seen as essentially two stages of killing. The first stage of killing is what were called Einsatzgruppe and mobile killing units. And that is, you sent a group of people, of officers and of SS men, into a village, a hamlet, a city, a town. You rounded up the Jews, the gypsies, and Soviet commissars, and you brought them to a valley, a wadi. You shot them one by one, bullet by bullet, town by town, city by city, village by village. And during a period of uh, less than a year, a year uh, and the like, more than 1.5, and we'll talk about what we're learning about that, million people were killed, mobile killing units. Just a word about who the perpetrators were. The interesting thing about mobile killing units is the vast majority of the officers were college graduates. Some were, in fact, um, lawyers. One had a PhD in the Institute of Economics and was a prestigious academic. One was an opera singer, a couple were clergymen. So they were not what we would call thugs. They were reasonably cultured men. There was a problem with this killing, which then led to the transformation of the Holocaust. And that was that this killing was a public Two, it was difficult for the perpetrators, and many had breakdowns. And C, it was time-consuming and personnel-consuming. So this is where the Holocaust has a brand new transformation, which is that it moved from, if you have mobile killers and stationary victims, what's the next stage in the process? What's the reversal of the process? Say it out loud. You have mobile victims and stationary killing centers. What made the victims mobile? And what do you see in virtually every Holocaust film? Trains. What? Trains. trains. What made the victims mobile were trains. And then you had the creation of something called killing centers or death camps. The point being that instead of making the killers mobile and the victim stationary, you reversed the process. And you created a new entity, which was essentially called a killing center, a death camp. And the task was to join industrialized killing with the Henry Ford notion of assembly line. Now, let's give you some statistics. Six death camps were created. The one you know most famously is what? Auschwitz. Auschwitz. But let's look at three other camps. There was a camp called Belgius. Belgitz was in operation between March and December 1942. 500,000 Jews were killed in 10 months, including two months in which it was repaired and reconfigured because they were killing too many people for the gas chambers to handle it. It had a staff of 104, of whom only 14 were German. And by December 1942, it was essentially ceased operation because for a very basic reason, all the Jews in the region were already dead. And how many known survivors were there from Belgians? The figure is going to startle you, there were two. 500,000 people killed 10 months, actually, in eight months, two known survivors. Another camp was called Treblinka. Treblinka went into operation in July 1942. And over the next, uh, until August 1943, it killed in the neighborhood of 825,000 to 900,000 people. 
were the staff of 120 of whom 30 were SS and 90 were Ukrainians. Number of survivors from Treblinka was about 65. <coughs> and the reason they survived was because there was an uprising in Treblinka on August 2nd, 1945. Some 300 people escaped. And by the end of the war, only 65 were alive. Now, third camp was a place called Chelno. Chelno was a death camp with 350,000 people killed in a two-year period. It used <coughs> mobile gas chambers. And the number of known survivors from Chelno are two. So what you're seeing is you're seeing an industrialized form of killing which uses an assembly line. You have arrival, you have in these places not selection, but you essentially have them march to where their hair is shaved, and then they are undressed, they're sent into the gas chamber, and the biggest problem that they faced in this killing process was what was called uh, body disposal. Meaning that it's not easy to get rid of so many bodies. They first tried burying them, and then they tried cremating them. Now, what made Auschwitz unique was that Auschwitz was actually three camps in one. It was, and you will not know it because you always hear the word Auschwitz, but Auschwitz was three camps. It was Auschwitz <coughs> one, which was a penal colony or prison. Auschwitz III, which was uh, a series of 50 subcamps, which were industrial camps in which they worked for people as slave labor. And Auschwitz II, which is known as Birkenau, with those famous railroad tracks going into the center of the camp, which was essentially a death factor. Auschwitz II, the number of people killed were 1.1 to 1.3 million, and it was an assembly line factory of death. That's the roughest outline of the Holocaust. You know, let's talk about some things that we've learned in the recent times and what we stand to know. Four of the camps were never liberated with prisoners in them. They were essentially, after their job was done, they were plowed under and trees were planted. And with trees being planted and the like, they were covered up. They became pastoral, as it were, villages. And in fact, if you go to Treblinka, you almost feel like you're going to a beautiful summer camp with uh, beautiful uh, trees, weeping willows, and your temptation is to walk to your friend and hold hands and think you're going for a walk in the woods. They essentially were plowed under to disguise what they had, and the question then becomes, how do you learn what goes on there? We have had a very interesting new form of archaeology, which is going to be practiced all over, which is called the archaeology, and I hate to use it because it, sounds, it, it is technical, cruel, difficult, but it's a very interesting thing. It's called the archaeology of genocide. And one of the things that we discovered is the same material that oil companies use to understand where they're supposed to dig for oil can be used to chart mass burial fields and show you what's plowed under the ground. And therefore, you don't have to dig until you know where you're digging and what you're digging. And therefore, you can get a clear outline of the camp without either coming across the gruesome sight of bodies <coughs> or without digging up a whole area where you find nothing. And what this has allowed us to do is to map these camps without, as it were, digging them up completely. We also have the second thing that has happened, which is that there's a very interesting figure in this field called Patrick Dubois. Patrick Dubois is a French Roman Catholic priest. His father was incarcerated in a camp, uh, not because he was Jewish, but because he was political. 
and who grew up hearing stories of Nazis and Nazi camps. And he then went to the killing fields, and he began to interview with the priest power. He began to interview people now in their 80s, and asked them, where are the people buried? And what he's discovered in these killing fields of the mobile killing units is he's discovered several things that are very important pieces of forensic evidence. First of all, he's discovered that there are many more killing fields than we thought there were. And that townspeople knew exactly where they were. Secondly, he has dug up some of these and discovered very interesting things. He's found a couple of artifacts which you don't think of as evidence. But let me give you an example. He found keys. Some of you are carrying keys. Anybody think of what a key represents? What does a key represent? Let's make it easy for you. It represents that when you park your car on campus, what do you expect to be there when you come back out? And what do you expect to be untouched and on, on blush? And how many of you locked your door when you left your home this morning? And how many of you expect to walk into a home that is safe and undisturbed? <coughs> right? All of that is represented by what? By keys. You don't think of this as important evidence, but think of what it means. And then if you ever panic when you left your, when you left your what? Your door open, unlocked, when your kids and your parents yelled at you, closed the door. But the idea of finding keys meant that certain people went to their death, suspecting not that they were going to die, but what? They're going to return home at night and be safe. Now, interestingly enough, in Macedonia, for example, the Nazis, uh, actually the Bulgarians, it wasn't the Nazis, the Bulgarians asked you, before they sent you and deported you, they asked you to put your keys in an envelope and to write your address on the envelope. Why should they have to bother what? They deported 7,000 Jews, why should they have to bother with 3,000 keys and figure out what earns the department, where do you live, what's your address, put your keys in the thing. One of the interesting things is the guy said I wrote any address I could imagine, but not what? Mine. They also discovered bullets. Now we know enough about cop shows to know that bullets what? Are forensic evidence. <clears throat> What bullets also show you is who the killer was, in one sense, not individually, but collectively, because they found different types of bullets. They found the bullets that were used by the Army, the bullets that were used by SS, the bullets that were used by police, and the bullets that were used by neighbors. The bullets that the cops use are different than bullets you can buy at Sears or at Kmart. The bullets that it, of the equivalent of Sears or Kmart, the bullets that the German army used were manufactured where? In Germany. And the bullets that the local police used were manufactured what? Locally. So the bullets show you something very interesting. They show you who the killer was generically, meaning how many sites were killed by the army, how many sites were killed by the SS, how many sites were killed by local police, and how many sites were killed by neighbors. Now that also forced the revision of certain areas because we know now there was a controversy in Poland about seven or eight years ago after a book was published called Neighbors in which a man, a man by the young girls did a history of the town of Jedwabne, J-E-D-W-A-B-N-E. Jedwabne was a town which had always written its history that the Germans came into Cape Town and killed the Jews. 
boasted a history of the town in which he showed that the Germans were in the area, but they never entered the town. And neighbors killed their Jewish neighbors <coughs> because they figured, why should we let the Germans come in and confiscate the property? If we do the killing, we can what? We can move into their homes, take over their uh, businesses, and we can confiscate whatever they have not. And for 50 years, they had told themselves the Germans had done it, when in reality, every one of an entire generation knew exactly who had done it. And what you had then was the bullets which displayed the evidence. They had a third piece of forensic evidence that was enormously significant. When they dug up some bodies, they found that there were not bullet wounds. If they were not bullet wounds, that meant that in certain cases, fathers took a bullet and threw their kids into the pits. Their kids were unwounded. Husband took bullets for wives, mothers took bullets for children, wives took bullets for husbands. And then you had a very interesting thing that is being rewritten now because for years the reports were that the ground kept moving for several days, which everybody interpreted in a very interesting way. Everybody interpreted that as meaning that bodies, rigor mortis sets in, bodies settle. But now we're seeing something very interesting, which is that people were struggling for several days to get out of these mass burial fields because they literally were buried alive. And because of the project that we worked on with Steven Spielberg, we now have the testimony, one of which is almost humorous because of the innocence of the testifier of people who are buried alive. A boy who was 10 years old tells the story, and you'll understand why it's quasi-humorous for a moment. He said, I stood there, and I heard all the rifle shots, and I fell into the mass grave. I thought I was dead. I was surrounded, I was overflowing by blood. But something peculiar happened. I still saw, I still heard, I still smelled. And then he said something very interesting. If this is death, death is not too bad. Meaning he literally thought what? He literally thought he was dead. Then I realized that it wasn't my blood because I had no pain. It was my father's blood, my brother's blood, my mother's blood that were all over me. I was stark naked in the pit. So I waited till the night time. And then I tried to throw my father and mother off me because they had fallen upon me and I escaped out. Or what we see was that sometimes heroism occurred not in his survival, but the fact that his father pushed him into the pit in advance of the shooting, and therefore what? He saved his life. And we see that that happened in many places, and the unsettling the ground was not only rigor mortis setting in, but also something else, which was the people struggling who had survived to get out. Let's talk now for a couple of minutes about things we're discovering. Some of you, if you hear the Nazis, you keep hearing in the back of your mind, following orders. <coughs> following orders, following orders. One of the things you, if you had studied the Holocaust years ago, you would learn that one of the real ethics that came out of it is it's not enough to follow orders. You are responsible for your deeds, even if you're an individual. And even if you go against the code of ethics, even if you go against your officer, you have to follow the code of ethics. And there are grounds, even in the military, to refuse to carry out an order. 
when I teach military ethics, it's one of the issues that we go through. The most interesting change in research emphasis now has been in a very interesting way that we don't see it as a matter of following orders from the top down, but as innovating and creating. Let's take a look at two examples. The gas chambers that we see in the movies and think of had two different order or origins. And the origins, I will talk about both origins. The first origin of the gas chamber was in the medicalized killings that were that were um, that were uh, began in October 1938, uh, October 1939, called the T4 program, the so-called euthanasia program. The question becomes, if you're creating a master race, how do you create a master race and you have to start <coughs> children? How do you create a master race and you have enfeebled children? How do you create a master race and you have generally ill people? So the first to be killed, ironically, were not the Jews. The first to be killed in World War II, aside from the military field, were Germans living at home who were an embarrassment to the myth of Iron supremacy. Let's use non-PC language. You can't have a master race and a retarded child. That, that killing went three dimensions, and it showed you the innovation that took place. The first way they killed people was, was by withholding food, starvation. But starvation takes what? A long time. And hearing people moan from starvation is what? Unpleasant. So then they used sedation, giving people shots. And they found that nurses found that difficult, and doctors find that difficult, because what are you doing by doing that? You're killing Africa. So the third stage was they developed gas chambers, and the gas chambers went from mobile gas chambers to stationary gas chambers, in which you could have one person drop gas in, and tens of people, and ultimately hundreds and thousands of people could be killed. And again, not for Jews first, but for Germans, German non-Jews, who were embarrassment to the myth of Iron supremacy. They found a second thing happened was that if you have a child who's institutionalized, you don't stop loving that child. In fact, some parents love their needy children almost more than what than their quotation marks, normal children, because they're concerned about them 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So they found that when these children died, and they were told that they died, the first person that a parent called was another person who had an institutionalized child. And if two kids died, then you felt that something was wrong. And what was the first thing that parents then did is to call a third person and when three, four, and five children were dead, you understood that there was a massive problem. And that led to public protest. It even led to a denunciation by Bishop Count Bangal. So the point being that the Germans found that it was very difficult to do that with the consent of the population. So they drove it underground. And they then built gas chambers and the like much later on far away from the field. Second origin of gas chambers was using what's the easiest way to gas people. Nobody builds mobile gas chambers until you order to or until you can have it. So they took furniture trucks. They turned to a mechanic who was a lowly mechanic and they said, how would you make a furniture truck into a gas chamber? His probably first reaction was, beats me. 
The second reaction was, well, the easiest way to do that is to take the exhaust and to rechannel the exhaust into the truck. Seal the back of the truck, drive the truck so you burn the exhaust, and what? And let the people die. Well, they did that. They hooked up a rubber hose to the exhaust, they put a hole in the bottom of the truck, they hooked up the hose to the truck, they sealed it with a seal, and lo and behold, people were able to die 20, 25 minutes. Two problems with that. The two problems with that were very interesting, that if you killed that way, people pushed to the back of the truck, and they very often were able to push the door open. The second thing is if everybody put their weight in the back of the truck, the rear suspension gave way. That then led to an order to do the following, which is let's reinforce the rear of the truck and let's create better shocks and better rear axles so that we don't break. And the challenge went from the local mechanic to the engineer at the truck factory, building this reinforcement so that it worked. And then they discovered something else, which is that if people die, they, and I'm going to be a little bit graphic if I haven't been graphic enough, they urinate and defecate. And consequently, cleaning up is very difficult. So then what they did is they put a drain in the bottom of the truck with the seals so that you could what, hose it down. All of these were done not by, and then they discovered other things people could do, is they could short out the system by breaking the light bulb and putting something into the light bulb, they could short out the battery. So they had to reinforce the guards for that. All of this was done locally. All of this was done by local mechanics, not by a centralized office. And gradually the process evolved. Now let me leave some time for questions, so let me tell you what made Auschwitz different from any other place, and I'm going to borrow this to illustrate it. The reason Auschwitz is the paradigmatic camp is by the time Auschwitz was up and running, they had developed the idea that the human being was a consumable raw material to be discarded in the process of manufacture and recycled into the economy. Let me use this as an example. And let's compare it for a moment to slavery, but not to excuse slavery, just to illustrate the difference. <coughs> let's assume you come with a full bottle, normal mineral that contains the people. The idea was, if you arrived at Auschwitz young and able-bodied, you worked. You were chosen to work if they needed workers. That's why they sent you to Auschwitz III. But they didn't feed you adequately. They didn't rest you adequately. So what happened is you gradually had to diminish holding <coughs> the mineral, as it were, of your strength. When you came close to being empty, and you were no longer useful as a worker, and you saw the look in the eyes, and the look in the, um, in the eyes, you saw the look in the faces, you saw the emaciated bodies. Then they sent you over to Birkenau, where they essentially gassed you, but in gassing you, they also recycled those parts of your body that put you down. Here, because hair could serve as detonators, and hair is a great writer. We all know that hair is also a great insulator. The gold from teeth, the 1940 PhD thesis said essentially, why should we bury people with gold teeth when the teeth can be taken out and used by the Reich and by the Treasury? And it was taken out, recycled, sent ultimately to Switzerland. And then they also used the body uh, that was cremated, they used it as fertilizer 
They didn't use it as soap because it wasn't economically viable since the people had so little fat on it. And the idea was that they took the human being and they reduced them to the, bottom, the equivalent of the bottle. And then they did the responsible thing with the bottle, which is they recycled it. And they structured the camp in such a way that essentially they drained every valuable from you and then reconfigured you and disposed of you. And in that sense, what we've discovered again is that this becomes, and you discover it in all sorts of ways. Let's give you a simple example. German corporations invested $400 million in 1942, 700 million last month, in the slave labor around Auschwitz. They invested it because, and those of you who are in business school would understand that essentially, if you invest 700 million last month, $400 million, you're making what? A capital investment. You expect it to what? Yield fruits for many years. <coughs> They thought they were reconfiguring the world into a universe in which you could ultimately get rid of people as a byproduct of manufacturing. Another example, and this goes to understanding the perpetrator. And with this, I'll conclude, so we'll leave some time for questions. Shows you the evolution of the field also. 1960s, a great psychiatrist by the name of Bruno Bettelheim wrote a book called The Informed Heart. And he said essentially the Nazis infantilized the Jews and infantilized the prisoners. And what's the best example of infantilizing a prison? What's the difference between an infant and, a, and a, a child? What's the most basic reflection of the difference between an infant and a child? It's not hard math. Anybody? What? No, what's what's the process you want me to go that transforms it? Autonomy? What? Toilet training. Right? An infant or a young, young child needs what? Diapers. A child who is a little bit more mature, what? goes in the pipe. So when Bellheim saw the Jews and other prisoners making in their pants, he said they were infantilized. 1972, a friend of mine, Terence Dupre, wrote, writes a book called Anatomy of the Death, uh, Survivor's Anatomy of the Death Camp. And what he discovers is essentially that the Nazis decided to reduce the Jews into a pile, and you'll forgive the term, into a pile of shit. After you reduce them into a pile of shit, and he quotes a man by the name of Franz Steinbel, he said, why did you dehumanize these people if you don't kill them anyhow? He said, it made it easier because then they weren't fellow human beings. What do you do with a pile of shit? What do you do when you get up from the toilet? Flush it down and drain. You give any thought to what you're leaving behind? Just want to make sure what? You don't leave anything behind. Right? 1990s, a architect by the name of Robert Jan van Pelt, who's an architectural historian, discovers something very interesting in historical research. He discovers the plans for Auschwitz that were in a Soviet archive. And he discovered that they had developed 70 latrines for 35,000 people. Now that didn't mean anything to me. But to an architect, it meant a whole thing. What did it mean to an architect? An architect understands, for example, if you have 70,000 people, let's presume they've expanded Dodger Stadium. How many latrines do you need? There's a code. You grow up in a home in which virtually everybody in your home has access to a bathroom. Most of you grow up in homes with two and three bathrooms. 
right? Your architect knows how to provide for a family. And if you grew up poor and you had one bathroom in the family, it created some tensions. My damn sister wanted a shower for so long and I had to go to the bathroom. You also saw, and we saw in New Orleans, when the toilets don't clean, in New Orleans during Katrina, when the toilets don't flush, then the dome, which was built adequately with facilities without the infrastructure, the dome what? becomes a place of absolute havoc and craziness. Now what Van Pelt's discovery was that anybody looking at the plans as a professional architect would know that they were creating a biological catastrophe. Because 70 latrines can't handle 35,000 people. In most of our housing, 35,000 people would be handled by about 17,000 latrines. Right? And what became intriguing for him is that the plans for that were not developed at Auschwitz. They were developed hundreds of miles away by architects who put their seals on it and who embodied that professionally, never asking the question, what am I creating, what am I doing, and how is this going to function? Of looking as to how to house people in a warehouse type of style in which they could be structurally dehumanized even before they kill. Let's take some questions because I understand you have to leave in about four minutes. Any questions? <coughs> yes, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, with all the information that you've told us that we know and we've learned, what is the biggest question? The biggest question that still is trying to be answered is the question of how do we, how do we, how we understand how the most cultured, most scientifically advanced, most philosophically developed, most sophisticated culture in the heart of Western Europe was able to develop a culture which able, was able to perpetrate such a massive crime. And let me tell it to you in a story. There was a psychiatrist, a very great psychiatrist by the name of Robert J. Lefton, who was writing a book on Nazi doctors. He's going out to interview a Nazi doctor, and a survivor turns to him, his father's way to identify his own design. He says, tell me something, Bob, were these people human when they did what they did, or were they monsters? And Lifton said, uh, no, it's clear that they were human. Worse than that, for me, is they were doctors. <coughs> And because they were doctors, that's why I studied them. The survivor answered, it's demonic that they were not demonic. He looked and answered, it's absolutely essential for me to understand. And then um, they used the words in, in quotes, their humanity, meaning what they share in common with you and me. If we create them a universe of parts, that's different than if they are a reflection of what you and I might be capable of under certain circumstances with certain ideology, etc. So the first is to understand the perpetrator. The second is to understand a little bit of the capacity of people to live with this, to endure it, and ultimately even some of them, to, few of them, but some of them to survive it. And the third is to understand the humanity a counter-testimony to the humanity of those who put their lives at risk in order to save people. i give you a structural example. The Danes rescued 7,200 of their Jews, of 8,000 Jews. The Danes created an entire bureaucracy to be able to preserve the property of the Jews who were shipped off. Other societies created entire bureaucracies to confiscate and redistribute and give away the property that had suddenly come into their possession. What? What makes one people humane and decent? And what makes another people able to structure 
confiscation, welfare, distribution, persecution, etc. Another example. Uh, I'm going next month to a place called Macedonia. Macedonia presents a very interesting paradox. It wasn't occupied by the Germans, it was occupied by the Bulgarians. The Bulgarians killed, uh, transported to death, 11,144 Jews from Trace to Macedonia. And when it came to killing their own Jews, they were willing to persecute them, they were willing to confiscate them, their wealth. They were willing to harass them and to tax them, but they weren't willing to kill them. What makes a society willing, on the one hand, to kill, and on the other hand, to persecute, but not to kill? Part of what underscores my research is how much the more I understand, the more I don't understand. Other questions? Yes? Can you give a final, what is the latest number of Jewish victims, non-Jewish victims I've heard debate? Okay, very interesting, very interesting, very important question. The general view of numbers, there's a symbolic number which is called <laughs> 6 million Jews. It could be that on the basis of the research of um, Patrick de Brown, we're going to increase, that we're going to find that that number is increased. The number is essentially that we can count on because they've been verified. And, and I published a book on the numbers, for example, at Auschwitz. And let me show you how we got to them for one second. We took the number of people who arrived in Auschwitz, the number of people who left Auschwitz, the number of people who survived Auschwitz, and we figured that those who neither left Auschwitz nor survived Auschwitz essentially were, and were deported to Auschwitz, were killed at Auschwitz. We came to a guesstimate which is between 1.1 and 1.3, and the reason we don't know the answer is because not all of these people, even if they were deported to Auschwitz, died at Auschwitz. Some died on trains, and a few, very, very few escaped. Uh, Belgians, we can give you virtually the first in Treblinka, we have a 75,000 type of gap in terms of what we know, how well we can give you uh, again with that. The one thing we don't know is the number of people killed in the mass slaughters. Now some of you have heard the word 5 million non-Jews. 5 million non-Jews is both an understatement and a gross overstatement. How can it be both? If you're talking about civilians who were killed in the apparatuses of the death of the death universe of the, of the Nazis. The figure is significantly less than 5 million, except if you begin to include 3.2 million Soviet POWs who were killed in 1941 and early 42, when Germany uh, conquered areas of the Soviet Union and took Soviet POWs and it put them into barbed wire camps and didn't feed them. And then in 1942, when they understood the war was going to take longer, they started feeding them and taking care of them. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 3.2 million Soviet uh, troops died in these areas. Were they victims of the Holocaust? Were they victims of World War II? That's a debate. The Poles used to have the number that, eight, that uh, 2 million Poles died in Auschwitz. The number that the Poles can now prove are 83,000. Gypsies had the number that anywhere between uh, 200 and 500,000 uh, died. Uh, the numbers are probably closer to 100,000. So you don't get to the figure of 5 million and you understand that it was, in, in one sense, an invented figure. Now, understand this, the confusion about numbers in mass murder is usually true. Let me give you uh, a, a, another example. Uh, I was in Rwanda right after the genocide. And my job was to advise the government on how to document genocide. Because when I was there, they had still had open mass graves. And I, I can't tell you what it's like to be in a village which has uh, an open mass grave of 25,000 people to see, see kids riding their bicycles around it. So 
So we tried to document it so we could bury these uh, prices and close them and not have denial. Now the figure has gone up in Rwanda from uh, 200,000 to 800,000. But, uh, and I'm now not popular in parts of Rwanda because I keep asking the question, methodologically, how do you kill 800,000 people in 90 days? And if the Nazis couldn't do it with mechanized killing, how could the Rwandese, who were much more primitive and who killed, you know, forgive me now, they killed with machetes. And to kill with a machete, you have to be within arm's length of the victim. If I kill with a machine gun, God forbid, I can kill everybody in this room with a machine gun. Right? And I don't have to stand next to you, but the machete, I have to go one to two to three to four to five. So the figure doesn't add up, but you have lots of confusion. It's what they call the fog of war. My suspicion is that if you give me what I would say, I'd say the guesstimate is between the low of 5.1 million Jews to a high of about 6.4. If you give me civilians, I would have to spend hours with you going through the idea, how do you define civilians who were victims of what? Uh, let's close with a terrible example which shows you Heinrich, uh, and Reinhold Heydrich was assassinated in May 19. Uh, 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 it was assassinated within about 10 miles of a village called Radice. Radice had nothing to do with this assassination, but the Germans decided they were going to avenge his death. They killed all the men of Radice, they sent to concentration camps for women and children, and then they reprinted Czech maps with, uh, without the town of Radice. They wiped it off the face of the earth. What were they victims of? Now, that doesn't mean they weren't victims. But how are you as a responsible scholar to define them as victims of what? And consequently, once you get through that debate, you can understand. Time. Thank you very much. Professor Barenboom, obviously an encyclopedia of all of this. So please join me in thanking him.